record? Yes, you do. Okay. All right. Three, two, one. Hi, this is William Ramsey. Welcome to William Ramsey Investigates. On tonight's show, I have a very special guest. His name is Fred Gianelli. He is an American electronic musician, and he goes back to uh, Psychic TV, Genesis P. Orge, and some of the early uh, experiences in acid house music. So he's going to talk about that. Uh, Fred, are you there? Yes, I am. How are you doing? I'm doing well. Thanks for being on the show. I really appreciate it. You have uh, quite a history. You have a bunch of projects and aliases, and you go by the Kooky Scientist, Acid DJ, Kinky Scientist, the new. But uh, can you tell the audience a little bit about yourself and how you got started in electronic music? Uh, well, I started out as a guitarist at the age of 13 and just wanted to uh, produce records. So I went to college for a little while and then I uh, studied philosophy and also worked in a recording studio which was kind of a commercial jingle studio and they uh, helped out um, friends of mine who had bands and I did their live sound and, and then I ended up getting into producing their records and stuff. So. And that was all outside of Boston or in uh, Eastern it was Massachusetts? All yeah, it was all in Boston. Yeah. Gotcha. And uh, how did? And then you know, at a fairly early age, you got involved in some other um, early bands. Can you talk about those? Uh, well, let's see. Before I met uh, Genesis Peorage, that was in 1984. So I had done. Um, I had produced a, a seven-inch record for a friend of mine. It had a kind of a ska band called Dub Seven. Mm-hmm. And, uh, and before that, I had done uh, my friend's rockabilly band. Gotcha. Uh, the Alley Beats. I just did live sound for them. They didn't make a record. Gotcha. So you did some. Uh, you you had a different style of music before Psychic TV, correct? I mean, as a producer and sound guy, you, you just try to make it sound as good as it possibly can. So it, it wasn't like um, I had a style. I mean, there was a lot of different genres around in the early 80s, late 70s, early 80s. You know? right. So, so I mean, we, we in Boston, I think we, we had a very good scene because we had a lot of college radio stations where um, just uh, community people could, could just play records on the radio station. They could get a show. Right. So they could really go deep and spend a lot of money on records that you couldn't necessarily afford and expose everybody to everything. Right. Well, what's the famous line from Spidal Tap? It's not a college town. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That's the opposite. So uh, you're in Boston, and, and talk a little bit about how you got involved in Psychic TV with Genesis P. Orge. Okay, so in, um, in 84, I uh, was still working in the recording studio, and it was just a commercial jingle studio. Okay. And... Um, he, he was booked by some friends of mine who went to Mass Art. Okay. And um, I was out of college by then. And um, Still relatively young, like 23, 24? 24, yeah. Oh, gotcha. So um, they were invited to play at, uh, at the Massachusetts College of Art. And so Jen showed up with this guy, John Gosling, and, and they were somehow booked to hang out with us for like 10 days. Interesting. And um, they went off and did one show in Chicago also, but they were like just hanging out with us, hanging out, talking, you know? Mm-hmm. And so that's when I got to know him. I knew of Robin Gristle. I, had, I have a couple of their records by that point, you know? Gotcha. So... So you had known of them, and then how did that relationship develop? I mean, I think that those guys were were interested in art as well, not just music at that time, correct? Yeah, I mean, back at the time, it was kind of like, it's kind of so funny that you take it all seriously, the whole cult aspect of it, because it was all kind of a, a making a mockery of cults Interesting. and a play on the, um, on the a fan club, you know? Uh-huh like a glorified fan club and then at cer- at certain points Jen would actually take it seriously and you're like well this guy really <laughs> believes his bullshit 
<laughs> so so and, you you never got involved in that side of the music then, is that right? No, the Temple of Psychic Youth was not part of the band when I was in the band. All the members of the band except for Jen and Paul were not involved with it. Gotcha. I didn't know that. And we met, you know, we we hang out with the kids and stuff that were into that. Mm. And it was just a little club kind of ego gratification kind of you know, see how far you can get away with it. But the thing is, um, you know, Jen, sometimes, I think he when he met a person for the first time, he would size them up and see how much he could pull them all over their eyes. I see. Did he try that with you? Uh, not really, because we were, we were hanging out for so long, for, for hours in a day, you know? Mm-hmm. I see. And so he, he didn't really impress me in that respect at all. I mean, the most interesting thing I respected him was that he had um, he had edited a, a book about uh, contemporary artists, which is a reference manual that was in you know, every library uh, where there was a reference department and artist books. And so he was a re respected. Is that kind of uh, kind well? Of I don't know about respected. <laughs> <laughs> he still got his book out, you know, pre-internet days. Yeah. Well, you know, he was hired. That was his only straight job i mean it was because he was known as a as a controversial artist in england right. and he was asked to uh edit this book which was get in touch with all these contemporary artists and then uh put it together in a big reference manual so everybody's listed and they have their their uh, history easily accessible to anyone in the world before the internet yeah interesting so that your relationship with them lasted what for i think you even earned a spot on wikipedia as the fred gianelli period from 88 to 92 is that right yeah that's pretty shocking yeah <laughs> <laughs> okay so i mean was it was it mainly uh Orage's interest in acid house that made that that kind of put you guys together on the same path well no i mean in 84 he uh we became friends mm -hmm. uh, well as as friendly as you can be with a, an egomaniac like that okay um and he wanted to help me put out a record of mine my first uh, individual record that i produced myself so i made that record after i met him and then i went to england and cut it and then he offered to put it out on his record label i see what was the title of that album uh, the name of that record project was called Turning Shrines, and it was uh, just me and my friend Neil Sugarman, and we met this girl named Asako. And Neil went on to to qu become quite famous. He ended up uh, starting a label called Daptone Records, and he worked with Sharon Jones, and, and then he got hired to be in Amy Winehouse's big albums. So Neil eventually had a big career, a much more successful musical career than I have had. <laughs> That's interesting. Is he is he from England? No, Neil's from right of right, Massachusetts. Interesting. That name sounds familiar. Sugarman. Yeah. I'll have to look that yeah. up. Uh, he's pretty famous now. Yeah. Gotcha. And so you uh, you you cut that first album, and then you just ended up playing with with uh, Psychic TV. Is that correct? Well, yeah. What happened was I I did a second record just by myself, a very low budget one, another Turning Shrines record. Okay. And then Jen invited me over to England to record uh, this kind of novelty record. It was a, a cover version of a Jimi Hendrix song. With And I asked him if I could... Uh, I had met his daughter in 85. She was a little girl then. And she had a cute little English voice. And I thought, well, I have this funny arrangement of Jimi Hendrix's Are You Experienced? And I thought it would make a great novelty record. So we, he invited me over to record that in the summer of 88. Gotcha. And that's, uh, he was in London at the time? Yeah. Yeah. He hadn't been kicked out or he hadn't been exiled yet then, right? Uh, he, I don't think he was exiled at all. Okay. I mean, uh... <laughs> well, I think there's different sides to that story, right? Yeah. There's, uh, he he really milked that, that for all it was worth, like gotcha. he does everything, you know? I see. So, yeah, but that was actually after you were with, with uh, the band, right? Yeah, so by 88, I'd gone to make this record, and then he invited me to become a member of the touring band, and I flew back home, I programmed a bunch of music uh, material that he had, and some that I had written, and we just went out on the road and did it in America in 1988. Gotcha. And did you, was it, was it an international tour or just the States? 
No, that first tour was like three months in the USA, and then we went back to England to tour England, and um, Margaret Thatcher had banned acid house music. I see. And because know. and because we had used the word acid house in our uh, marketing, a lot of our gigs were canceled because Margaret Thatcher had banned it because it was too popular. Interesting. I didn't know that. How did it come to her attention? Uh, well, basically, people were throwing rays and big parties, and they just get a sound system, rent a, you know, go out to a big field, get generators. People would show up, park their cars there on the side of the road, and next thing you know, you have a, a problem. I see. I didn't know that. Yeah. That was right there at the beginning of the whole rave scene, too, right there in the 80s. Yeah, too, I right mean, 80, 88 was the big summer of Acid House in England, which, you know, confused it the authorities because they thought it was just a drug scene but really uh it was a music scene that brought people together like like you know you'd never seen before i mean people just got along because all of a sudden they they just wanted to dance and have fun and um some of them are doing drugs but it, it was it was not as <laughs> most of them were looking for drugs <laughs> right it, they, they couldn't find it it wasn't as big of a bacchanalia as uh, thatcher would would assume i guess no i mean nothing is from my perspective gotcha. i mean I, i'm still doing music and i you know it doesn't really i don't see that much gotcha and uh but i mean would you say that those were really the beginning the real seeding of this kind of modern techno electronic uh uh groups like what what are they having you know the, these weekend rave type parties that are. What's the one that's in uh, Las Vegas? Uh, well, that is a, more, a very commercialized uh, mainstream version of it. And even the Detroit Techno Festival, which my friends run, called Movement, which happens on Memorial Day, is um, is becoming more and more commercial because you know people don't know the uh, the roots of it. But yeah, I mean, the, 1988 England was definitely the the beginning of this. Um, it's kind of uh, electronic phenomenon, rock, yeah, rave yeah phenomenon. phenomenon. Was was uh, MDMA? Was Molly? Was that popular back then? Was that around in those late eighties? Do you know? Oh yeah, it was definitely popular. around. Gotcha. I mean, Jen was doing a lot of it. He he um, he was interested in it and doing it, and probably dealing a little bit with it. But I never got into it. So yeah, I see. And uh, I mean, was would you say? On, I mean, I guess all rock tours are pretty much saturated in some type of drugs. Would you say that that was the case with Psychic TV on their tour? Uh, definitely not. Interesting. <laughs> it was. It was. I mean, we had two little children with us, so it was definitely more like the Partridge Family than uh, the Ken Kesey bus, you know. Gotcha. The Merry Prankster. So you guys almost got signed to Electra Records. Is that right? Uh, no, we we almost got signed to. Um, well, we were we were dealing with this uh, popular indie label called Wax Tracks out of Chicago, and uh, they didn't have any money to sign us. And then they it turned out that they died of uh, Jim Jim Nash died of AIDS, oh, yeah. but hadn't told anybody, um, and they were going bankrupt. So we didn't know at the time, but we wanted to continue continue working with them, but we couldn't. And then we were talking to this album, uh, this label called uh, Almo Sounds, which hadn't started yet. Uh, basically, Herb Albert and Jerry Moss had sold A and M Records for a record uh, amount of money at that time, and we were contacted by this guy Howard Thompson, who was uh, one of the A and R guys for that label, vice president there, and he wanted us to sign with them. But he was going to take a sabbatical, so he basically invited me. He was working at Electra at the time, mm -hmm. invited me up, informed me about this, uh, and told me not to tell anyone for a year because when he came back, he wanted to sign us. Uh, he did keep his word. We did do demos, but we didn't get signed. <laughs> gotcha. And that was, then you went to record at Brilliant Studios in San Francisco, right? Yeah, that was when we did the demos for Howard. Yeah. Gotcha. Where, where is the, where was that studio? I wonder. What that place. was that was right in South of Market. It was okay. like, um, it was uh, it was a decent rock studio, um, big room. I think Kurt Cobain had had um, produced the Melvins there. That was. Oh, interesting. Yeah, that I was, mean, it's probably now the, the property is probably worth like five million dollars now. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. All of South of Market is just insanely. Oh, it's yeah. super commercial now. It wasn't what it was like back then. It's super gritty. You know, yeah. you had to kind of watch her. It was pretty sketchy in yeah, that right. neighborhood back then, yeah. 
Yeah, that's interesting. It says here that you played in Oakland too, Mr. Floppy's Flophouse East. That's a place a landmark in, in Oakland too, right? Uh, that was a that was like a small kind of loft party warehouse type of space. And that was after, you know, um, Jen got kicked out of England or, you know, left England, decided right. to go back. Well, he ended up in, in Northern California, right, with uh, uh, Winona Ryder's dad, right? Right. So what happened was uh, we were playing in London in probably 89, and I think Winona was over uh, working with Francis Ford Coppola for the Dracula film. Oh, I see. Which was being filmed in London, and we usually did a, a December show in London, and um, it was, there weren't many shows going on except for Gary Glitter, you know, something like that. So we did a December show, and they came to our show, and we didn't know them. And I remember an American, an older American guy, coming backstage and talking to Jen, but. You know, it was just chaos. We were just pack, packing up our equipment and getting ready to leave and stuff. Gotcha. So I remember seeing him there. And then when we went, you know, when the raid happened in England and they decided to go to England, they reconnected with um, with uh, Michael and... Um, Michael Horowitz. Yeah, Michael Horowitz. And they didn't even know that they that they were, you know, the parents of, of uh, one owner rider. Right, so. right. And Horowitz, <laughs> by the way, is also... Uh, Timothy Leary's archivist. I don't even know if Michael Horowitz is alive. <clears throat> yeah, he's he's still alive, and and I, th that's how we met Timothy Leary. Is basically Michael introduced us. Oh, interesting. Where you met him in England or, or in Northern California or LA? No, I think I, you know, I never really was properly introduced to Michael, but he was there backstage. Uh -huh. You know, when we were when I was busy dealing with my equipment and stuff. And he was talking to Jen. I remember Cindy came to our gig at the floppy at the flop house. Gotcha. Also, so Michael and Cindy were there for that gig. Right. Um, so Michael Horowitz is Winona Ryder's father. Just to let people know, I don't know if that was yeah. clear. Um, <clears throat> right. So then the kick out. I mean, were you there when when Jen got kicked out of England? No, I was in Boston, um, and I had just spoken to our drummer, and I had this weird feeling that we were never going to work again like a couple of weeks before this happened. Jen and Paula and the kids had gone off to uh, Nepal. They had sold a painting by Austin Osmond Spare, this, you know, occult painter. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, it was very valuable and they sold it to Chris Stein from Blondie because Jimmy Page wouldn't buy it. <laughs> the price was too high. The price was too high. Jen was gouged uh, Chris Stein on the price. So with that money, he went off to Nepal for, for the holidays. Um, and then that's when the raid happened. After, while so they while he was out of, out, of, out of, right, so that he didn't go back to UK. He went somewhere else. No, you know, he, just, he just decided to use that publicity and say, oh, you know, I'm exiled. Right, I'm an exile. It's not necessarily right. true. It was more dramatic. But, I mean, yeah. they, didn't they find... I mean, some of the early art he did was very edgy, like extremely edgy. Would you agree with that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it was it was definitely, you know, trying to confuse people. Unfortunately, it confused people 10 years after the fact. Gotcha. So they found some of that art that he had done decades before. Is that one one of the things that... I mean, what they get called the records of civilization. I mean, there's some pretty uh, intense phrases that the authorities talked about. Um, yeah, but, yeah, but 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 that's a that's like a a term that was used by a, an MP who was himself busted for having I don't know prostitutes or something like that. Well, so it's like the the gutter press in England really loves to exaggerate and. Right. That's true. Go crazy. And if you really want to understand um, more of the inside information that dispels a lot of the myths, I suggest you read um, Cozy Fanny Tootie's book, Art, Sex, Music, which is on Faber. Uh, I think it's Faber Social is the, is the publisher. She was one of the early members of yeah. Psychic TV, correct? Well, before that, she was not in Psychic TV. She was in Coombe Transmissions. Right. And then she was a founding member of Throbbing Gristle. And she was Jen's partner for those years. And if you want to learn a lot about Jen's character, then that's 
that's the go-to book. <laughs> that's the foundation, right? His real name is what? Megson? Is that right? What's his last Neil, name? Neil. Neil. Yeah. Neil Megson. I only knew him as Genesis, and everybody just calls him Gen. So. Gotcha. Yeah. So I mean, at some point, he, you know, uh, transformed himself. He's it's still undergoing the transfer day, transformation. And my understanding is that he's not in great health right now. Is that true? Uh, it's kind of funny. I was in Denver and I met one of his other guitarists who's also American and from Massachusetts. And we had a funny chat. We had never met, but we talked a lot about Jen and we had a lot of laughs. And uh, don't believe everything that Jen says. Okay, because, I mean, I <laughs> through the grapevine I'd heard he had like some kind of blood cancer or something like that. So. Yeah, he supposedly has leukemia. That's what he's saying. And he raised a lot of money. Uh, oh, I see. For that, but uh, I, w I, you know, I don't believe anything he says anymore. So. Gotcha. So you, um, you know, had that four-year run, and what kind of initiated your your departure from Psychic TV? Uh, well, basically, we did those demos in San Francisco, right? And then a month later, I get a letter from Jen and Jen's lawyer, and it said that. Um, in this letter if we did get this deal that I would have to f forfeit the first two hundred thousand dollars we made to, to Jen okay, okay. <laughs> and I was like well, I guess I got my walking papers I never responded to that I see. and then uh, you know as far as I was concerned the group was done I see. Uh, he had left the whole he had abandoned the whole London all our guys in London and that was the whole band, you know? That was the, the core of it. Yeah. I mean, there were two camps in the band. There was the workers, and then there was the, the Porridge family, you know? Gotcha. Gotcha. And, you know, did he, I mean, did you ever see him engage in very strange practices? He apparently has some peculiar stuff he does. Is that true? Uh, well, when I was in England, I lived in his house, and uh, it was pretty much a really boring household. Gotcha. Um, what kind of practices are you referring well, to? Well, you know, well, he said that he met Aleister Crowley on a street in 1953 right. after Crowley died in 47. And that I've heard a rumor that that's how he got his name uh, as Genesis P. Orge is about the consumption of human semen. Is that correct? Uh, no, that's not correct okay. at all. I mean, Jen said that. I'm sure he said that in an interview. I I think I remember reading it. But Jen got his nickname in in school uh, because I think he was um, he was running some Bible class or something. Gotcha. I mean, and he uh, did you ever see? Like, I heard that when he was running the Temple of Psychic Youth, he wrote a book. I think it's called the Psychic. Bible or something like that. Yeah. Did you ever see him writing that or doing anything with that? Uh, that was like that's just old um, documents from b before I was in Psychic TV. Oh, I see. So that was even. So that was from that. like the early eighties. Yeah. Gotcha. And you ever and, hear anything about the Process Church or anything like that? Yeah, I met I met Timothy Wiley. Gotcha. Interesting. In eighty nine, and he was just like a like a burnt out you know English hippie. <laughs> And he had a funny thing to say about Jen also. We had a good correspondence last year because I reconnected with him because um, I had found some old photos and I wanted him to have them. And then he just recently passed away in December. Right. But basically he's, his, his opinion of cults was the whole point of a cult is to get out of the cult. You know? oh, interesting. Once you realize <laughs> you're in it, you got to get out. Like exactly. Nex Nexium or something like that. Yeah, I mean the Nexium thing is I, I, I think Jen wishes... <laughs> he had a cult like that that was so financially successful. Oh, yeah, holy smokes. Millions you know, he and millions had of dollars. All these women and, and very, very wealthy donors. And it's like, wow, what a fantasy. <laughs> yeah, no, I think that Ranieri was living, is really living out kind of a male, you know, teenage fantasy. He's got these wealthy women benefactors. And there's, I mean, I talked to Frank Parlato, who had dealings with Nexium from the early days. Yeah, and yeah. He's had something like 50, 55 women. And those those um, complaints that the government put in were not for those women. It was for trafficking women under the age of 14. So there's stuff going on that the public doesn't know yet, you know. Yeah, I mean, it seems like, um, you know, it was all consensual. 
up to a certain point, right. and then he I went think, off the deep end. <laughs> yeah, I think you're right. I think that he just pushed the envelope. He started out as a multi-level marketing schemer, yeah. and yeah. so it just, yeah, he's not getting out of jail. So anyway, next no, he's year, not going anywhere. Yeah, oh no, but he's, Jen wishes wishes he had the Bronfman's. Yeah. <laughs> well, he Jen did hit hit the jackpot, didn't he? Wasn't he involved in a fire at uh, another record producer's house and? Uh, had a million dollar. Do you, do you remember so, or know about that? So yes, I know about that. And this was after I'd gotten my walking papers. Gotcha. He was. He started to try to put together another psychic TV in California, and they had a gig in LA. And they went down, and uh, this band, Love and Rockets, who formerly were known as Bauhaus, were signed to uh, Rick Rubin's label, American Records. Rubin, right? Yeah. And they were staying at uh, one of his properties which became a, a very nice studio. But at the time, Jen went down and, and they had given permission to rehearse there and um, s crash there. And apparently, you know, uh, I've heard conflicting stories about that. So gotcha. either they had a bunch of candles or the place burst into flames or something. But So the, 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 the nature of how the fire broke out has different stories, is that right? Yes. Uh, so they might they might have been involved, but didn't want to tell investigators or the insurance company. Well, because Jen was so seriously hurt, apparently, um, you know, everybody was uh, trying to not reveal what actually happened. I see. Well, if you can get a million and a half dollars in a settlement, you've convinced, you know, yeah. the, the insurance company that you are extremely disabled you know probably a disability or a claim a dis permanent disability i don't know well, i don't know that i don't know the nature of the case that's pure speculation but you know well, typically no, he, he definitely was physically hurt he definitely you know was was sent to the hospital and, and had a huge hospital bill okay and he had no money way to pay that and he was in the in the country i don't know how he could have stayed in the country with immigration interesting um, as an englishman you know well, he's been in the new what New York City or something like that for for. Some so time. yeah, that was that was after he was still with his, um, you know, in California he came with his first wife and his kids, and then she decided to divorce him, okay. and then he had the accident, and then he was really down and out, and so that's when he met his second wife, who was a New York City dominatrix, uh, so and uh, Mary J or what, Lady J? Yeah, he called her Lady J. Gotcha. And she took it, she took him and, and recu recuperated him. Let's see, and did and, that, and it took him. Yeah, sorry. And it took him like seven years to win that case. It took him a long time to win against oh, uh, Rick. Even. I didn't know that. So he was just down and out for years, and I was still friendly with him. But it was just about re-releasing -re old material, and he would just give it away to to labels that would put out like twenty CDs and not pay us. <laughs> oh, interesting. It's really bad. That's 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 unfortunate. It seems like that's uh, in the smaller kind of label type stuff. That kind of stuff happened. It happens a lot. Yeah, it happens a lot. Yeah. And would, did you see when you were in the band like any of the kind of uh, glimmerings or like how or why he wanted to go through this kind of intense body modification? No, he didn't really have that uh, when I was working with him. Um, you know, he had some personal. Um, Peccadillos, uh, you know, odd things like he didn't like his body hair, and he did. He had a really bad diet. He didn't eat well, and uh, so we had some hangups, you know. Gotcha. Because I mean, I I think that he did some pretty intense surgery. I mean, a lot of surgery. Yeah, yeah. Once he got that money, he 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 got into drugs heavily, um, because you know. Jackie was a heroin addict. <laughs> Who's that? Is that his wife? His wife, Lady yeah, Jane. Lady I, gotcha. Jane. Yeah. Oh, I didn't know. I mean, that. she became a, a pretty bad addict. She she was probably just using when they met. Um, but I briefly met her once before Jen had even met her, so I knew that she was kind of you know stumbling around on heroin. You know? Gotcha. And did was the per when he won the lawsuit against Reuben? Was it Reuben who personally paid out, or was it his insurance company? I think it was his insurance oh, okay. company because Rick showed up with a chauffeur-driven Bentley wearing a Slayer t-shirt in jeans 
and his beard down to his waist like ZZ Top. He used to hang out with the guy from ZZ Top. And he that was how he dressed for court, so he didn't care. He didn't care, right, yeah. That makes sense. I mean, he has too much money. <laughs> right. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so after you kind of left Psychic TV, what uh, what kind of stuff have you been up to since the, I mean, it's been quite 20 years or something like that. Yeah, it's struggling to survive, basically. I mean, I got into electronic music and I became a live uh, electronic artist where it's kind of like what a DJ does. It sounds like it, but it's not. It's all original and it's all from equipment. Nice. So, I mean, I assume that from the early days you were learning a lot of that new kind of electronic equipment that was coming out. I mean, even yeah, pre-computer. As, yeah, as it was coming out, yeah, before computers were used... In the in the late seventies, early eighties, I started getting into synthesizers and drum machines and guitars and effects, and then samplers came out. So I was all through my um, even in the jingle studio. I was I replaced the drummers on the jingle sessions with the drum machine. Interesting. What, uh, what uh, the technology is uh, super advanced at this point, right? That all yeah. these guys are using, yeah. Um, would do you go and you're, you're are you playing at kind of venues in Massachusetts or going elsewhere? Or? Occasionally, Massachusetts actually does not have a very good scene. I mean, like last weekend, I was in Denver, Colorado, and that was great. They had great sound system. I got a great recording, and the crowd was really receptive and excited. So, where where is the biggest scenes these days? Is it California? Uh, well, Berlin, Berlin. but in America. You know, for the style that I like, it's more Detroit-oriented. Interesting. So Berlin and Euro European is huge as well. Berlin is basically yeah, the center of the universe for electronic dance music. Yeah, I didn't Good, know that. You know, the, the genre that I like. What would you? Uh, how would you define your genre? It's more underground than the commercial stuff like that. Uh, who's that guy that that DJ kid that just died? Oh, Avicii. Of each, yeah, I don't know anything about that stuff, you know. <laughs> gotcha. yeah. well, I mean, he knows how to write a good, catchy pop tune, I guess. I mean, yeah, to me, that's just pop music, you know. Gotcha. And so, do you feel that you're kind of, do you still run around and kind of see some of these, uh, some of these early characters from Psychic TV or anything like that? Uh, no, I don't see anybody because everybody's in uh, England. It's still in England, right? And Jen's in New York, and I don't want to see him because he's hideous. And uh, his, yeah. his wife and, and children out in the West Coast, so I don't see them either. Gotcha. So they're all, I mean, his kids have got to be in their 40s now, right? Uh, they're probably in their 30s, yeah. Oh, that's right. Interesting. Did you ever kind of come across some of those early members of Psychic TV? People like, I don't know, they, used, they liked Burroughs, right? Peter Christofferson, some of those yeah. other characters. Yeah, I, I, I met Sleazy late in his life. Um, I met him up in Montreal, which turned out to be the very last Coil uh, show. Interesting. And uh, he was really nice. I mean, his reputation is, you know, a lot of these people, their reputations are much more scarier than their personalities. You know what I mean? Well, he was very intelligent. You know, he was the son of a, a what notable uh, professor. I found that out recently. Christopherson's dad was like a mathematician in London, England or somewhere. Yeah, I mean, Jen exaggerated the importance of Sleazy's um, family, but, you know, Sleazy was just a really kind of shy, you know... Um, intellectual. Would you describe him as an intellectual? Yeah, he was kind of thoughtful, but he's also extremely, you know, uh, homosexual and, you know, right. <laughs> and a little and a little undercurrents of that, but, you know... Uh, did you ever see him with John Balance or just him alone? No, I actually uh, the Coil show in Montreal was when John Balance did not go, so it became the last show. That and then good. shortly after that, like a f couple months later, he died. Right, he was a pretty heavy drinker too, right? He was all messed up, yeah. 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 So uh, yeah, Christopherson. I mean, my understanding is that he kind of trolled the gay underground, leather bars and stuff like that. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, I mean, he was he was uh, you know part of the 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 famous hypnosis design team, right? So he did a lot of record covers for Pink Floyd, say, Pink Floyd, Peter Gabriel's first three albums, Genesis. Yeah. Um, he took a lot of photos for those records. He did the last Led Zeppelin record, the cover of that one, right? With the obelisk. and then yeah. 
with the yeah the obelisk, obelisk yeah. Piece of thing, yeah. And then he, um, you know, became a video director, very successful video director, which he wouldn't even talk about. You know, he's That's just interesting. he was making a lot of money during the the heyday of MTV. I didn't know that. You know, I you know he did a lot of videos, but I'm surprised that he wouldn't be so. Why would you think that he didn't want to talk about that? Well, because he wanted to make he wanted to be an art, known for his art, you know, and that's why he was proud of Coil and and he just gave up on Psyche TV and working with Jen. He really had harsh words to say about Jen. You know, oh, also, I didn't, I didn't know that. But all those guys were Illuminates, right? Weren't they? What all members of the Illuminates of Thanateros, all the Coil members? Uh, I'm not sure hmm. what what their scene was because they were a very heavy gay scene, and and I wasn't. I'm not gay, so it wasn't really that my um, interest. You know? I didn't know that. The uh, did you ever kind of come across a lot of William Burroughs stuff when you were with Psychic TV or those guys? I mean, it seems like that was he was kind of their hero. Uh, well, I w I was born the same day as Jack Kerouac, so I've known about you know the whole Beatnik era since since uh, the '60s, right? Um, when I was growing up. And then David Bowie was really into, you know, name dropping William S. Burroughs, um, in the seventies. Gotcha. It wasn't Kerouac born in Lowell. That's where you're from, right? He's from Lowell. Yeah. yeah right. Right. A, a friend of my dad's, my dad's best friend, played football against Jack Kerouac in high school and then in college, and then Kerouac dropped out of um, college and uh, stopped playing football. Gotcha. Started writing. Yeah, I'm glad he did. Good. On the road, it's a great one. Good one. Um, and then, you know, what? how did you follow this whole Damien Eccles to Salem issue? Because I remember you were, you were on some of those yeah. boards with Salem four or five years ago. Right. Well, what happened was I, I didn't know Damien. I, re I remember the West Memphis 3 case, and I knew he was sent away, and I thought they were innocent at the time. It looked like they were railroaded. Gotcha. Um, so your opinion I, has changed? Uh, no, I still think he was railroaded. Okay. I think uh, it was one of the fathers of the stepfathers of the kid that did it. But right. Terry Hobbs. I, yeah, it sounds like it was. It, it, that guy looks sketchy. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> so I mean, so that's kind of what attracted. That's how I came across your name, was. Right, through right. that whole thing and situation in Salem with Mike Blatty and all those people. So what happened was Eccles got out of prison and next thing I see in the music press was that he was going to be in this little film and you know the clip. Right, IRL. Jen. IRL, right, with Jim. And then I'm just laughing like, oh, the poor guy. How much bad luck can you have in your life? You get <laughs> sent away for 18 years for something you didn't do and then you have to meet that asshole, you know? Oh man, holding a shotgun no less. There was a rumor yeah. out there that 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 he was not supposed to hold weapons, and that he had to fly back to Arkansas to deal with his with his probation parole? officer. Really? Yeah, parole. yeah, that's a rumor. I have not. I don't know. Somebody yeah. told me that, but uh, yeah, I mean, and they're, they're both. What is what does Genesis say in that clip? Bazooka Joe or something like that. Some kind of random statement. I don't know. That's all I know is Jen does not like chewing gum, and they made him chew gum, so that was kind oh. of good to torture him. Gotcha. But um, I mean, that was just a stupid little, you know, uh, art project by some publisher in New York. Right. I, well, I don't then, think that movie was more than 20 minutes, yeah. Yeah, and then it was like, uh, then the next thing I see, it's like Eccles moves to Salem, and he's like down the street from me. Right. So it was kind of funny when... Um, like Halloween had already happened. I think I was out of town for Halloween that year. And then I was riding my scooter over to Marblehead to go get coffee one morning. It's a cold, you know, November morning. And I see Eccles walking on all by himself on the sidewalk. And I just like pull over the scooter and say, hey, Damien Eccles, I got to talk to you. And I kind of scared him, you know. <laughs> He's like, huh. Who's this guy? And then we, I started telling him about Jen, and he's next thing you know, we're just laughing our heads off, you know. That's interesting. Because he was, um, he had just his book was coming out, so I said, "All right, I was, I'm going to come down to your book signing you know, next week." Right, Life After Death. Uh, yeah, the first one, right? Right. Yeah, so I go so. to Harvard Square and I go to the book signing, and then I'm waiting to uh, at the end. 
and he goes to Lori, his wife. He's like, Lori, this is the guy I was telling you about, the guy who knows Jen. And, um, and she was laughing. She was just like, oh, my God, he's so creepy. <laughs> That's funny. So how what what was the uh, did Eccles just know Orange from that movie or was he aware yeah. of him? Okay. Yeah, he had just met this weirdo in this film, yeah. Because there's another picture of them together with other people with uh Ferrera or whatever the girl is who's the lead on that movie. Yeah, she was she was in the movie too, but I think you know, they ended up getting in touch again when um Jen had that show at the, the Rubin Museum. No relation to Rick Rubin. Right, and I guess like, Damien did some tours and stuff, but I don't keep in touch with him. I just would like bump into him in Salem every day, you know. Interesting, because he was right down the street, and it's a really tiny town. Yeah, I mean, and, and there there was a you know I kind of followed it. I wouldn't say intensely, but I was definitely keeping tabs on a lot of the stuff that had gone on, just because of the all of the activity on that message board, you know. Yeah, I mean, so Vlad was, was Vlad was right down the street too. And and he was trying to get everybody in Salem upset about this guy. And it's like, well, he's already gone through the prison system. Right. He seems like he's rehabilitated. Uh, it, he probably didn't even do anything. And, you know, if if prison, I mean, he's a model uh, prisoner if, if rehabilitation works, you know. So why why are you harassing this guy, especially in a town called Salem, Massachusetts? Well, that's the there's a lot of strange overlaps because, you know, Eccles has an interest in the occult. Salem yeah. was where the witch trials were. Mike Blatty is the son of Peter Blatty, who wrote The Exorcist, yeah. a copy of which was in Eccles' room. There's a picture of it in one of the police photos yeah, of The Exorcist. Yeah. So it's just all this overlapping strangeness, and then. You're involved too. Who's friends with Orange? With it's, it, it's just a small it's world. Just, it's a very small world, and, and like Blatty ended up communicating to me quite nice and apologizing. He ended up becoming so obsessed with getting Damien Eccles, and nobody was joining his cause that he had to. He just moved. He just slithered out of town and moved to Oregon. Yeah, he's out. He went to three thousand miles away. But so yeah. did Eccles himself. And then Eccles yeah. got bored after a year because it's a small yeah. town. If you can afford to live in New York. Do it, you know. Gotcha. <laughs> I would do it. Well, the word on the street is he was doing his uh, some magic class, but didn't get a business license. Uh, did you hear that story? Uh, no, I don't. Yeah. Know. He, he seemed pretty organized with that stuff, but you know, it's all kind of you know hocus pocus and new age stuff. So yeah, it's true. It's not really my scene. So gotcha. Well, he's putting out a book on, on Halloween this year. Yeah. Called High Magic with Eddie Vedder. I don't know. God only knows what is in that. Yeah, he seems to be connected with a lot of you know wealthy people, so he's doing all right for himself. That's, that's the truth. I mean, if you raise twenty million dollars for your defense fund, you can get the best of everything. You know, money money can yeah. buy you the best attorneys, etc. Yeah, I think I think Peter Jackson um, used a lot of that Hobbit profits to help someone that he thought was you know innocent. Right. Basically. Well, they flew him down to to New Zealand. I th the rumor is, and I don't know if you can verify this, that Eccles is a is a he's like an orc in one of the films. Is that true? Have you heard that? Uh, I think I did see some press of that. Yeah. Yeah. I, I haven't verified that. Um. So we're at about forty five minutes. We've covered a lot of subject matter. Covered a lot of stuff. Anything else that you would like to add, or um, people, anybody, anybody wants to contact you, or anything like that? Um, well, I just think, you know, I think you're, you're, I don't know if you're a Christian or. Yes, I what, would say I'm Christian. Yeah. All right. So you're a Christian and you seem to have this, um, fascination with this stuff. Well, I was really a Crowley, I was a Crowley researcher. And so I was tracing the impact of Crowley on the 20th century. So I came across a bunch of different people, one of which was Genesis, who yeah. said he met Crowley. You know, and so I covered a lot of people. So Genesis was one of them. So I kept an interest in Genesis. And that was really how I got interested in the West Memphis 3 case was that Damien Eccles, there was an interest in Crowley. I had actually not even followed that case probably till 2011, 2012. Oh, okay. Yeah. And so then once I found out that Alistair Crowley was involved in the case and that uh, Damien Eccles, and they ta actually talked about it on the stand. I researched it. And they actually had a copy of Magic and Theory and Practice during... The case there was a, the, one of the prosecutors had it, and Damien Eccles was writing Alistair Crowley's name in kind of this code, 
yeah, that's yeah. in this. So that was really it. And so I was like, okay, well, he's, I mean, Eccles, I mean, he said on the stand he knew everything about the the occult or the esoteric or something like that, not verbatim. But so, I mean, we have a differing opinion on guilt on the West Memphis Three. There's no doubt about that. Yeah, I mean, also one thing I would like to point out is that um, you, you mentioned William Burroughs and uh, Crowley as big influences on Psych TV, and I would say that it's not those two. It's actually um, Burroughs' friend, Brian Geisen, who is more of a mentor, and um, Jen was definitely more enamored with uh, Brian Geisen. Interesting. What was the cut-up technique? And didn't he stare at, like, different types of lights and stuff to try to get a different consciousness? Uh, I don't know. I didn't know Brian, but, yeah, he did things like that. Yeah. He was also, you know, um, came up with the Dream Machine flickering light. Right, thing. Dream Machine, that's what I was thinking about. There's pictures of Orge with Burrow, so I know that. Oh, yeah. they, they Jen had brought uh, William S. Burroughs and Brian Geisen to England. For a performance, and that was the first Psyche TV show. What, from Morocco? In the early, in the early 80s. No, I think Burroughs was then living in New York by that point. Gotcha. And Geisen was in Paris. And then regarding, you know, uh, magic, um, Jen was not that big a Crowley uh, uh, fanatic. fanatic. He was right. he was definitely more interested in Austin Osmond Spare, who did not, who, who, who was an artist who was a contemporary of Crowley's, and, um, you know, Austin Spirit did not like Crowley. <laughs> they had some They had some correspondence. They were definitely aware yeah. of each other, but not yeah, nobody yeah. really liked Crowley. I mean, at the end of the day, I don't yeah. think that he was a likable character generally, but, yeah. Um, I think but, that the, it, I've read some of the correspondence in the 30s, so, you know, yeah. they, they were definitely talking, but definitely not hanging out with each other. No, they, they, they were not friendly. And also, Crowley was so poor in Berlin... And there's a really excellent book by this guy, Tobias something about Churton. the Crowley. Tobias yeah, Churton. Yeah. The Beast in Berlin. The Beast in Berlin. It's very, very funny because it's like, it doesn't make sense that, you know, these satanic figures and these people think, you know, you sold your soul to the devil. And it's like, well, don't you get any money for that? Because <laughs> <laughs> right. well, it seems like they have nothing but bad luck. You know? Well, that's really an excellent point. That's very true. There's a lot of bad luck that runs in these people's lives. Crowley in particular, who had a substantial inheritance that he dissipated yeah, yeah. and then was on the streets, Berlin, you know, begging for money, asking, get, trying to check his mail to make sure somebody sent him cash. And then he would spend it. You know, it was, a, he was a very peculiar character because he but, could have taken that money and invested it and lived like a king. Yeah. And that's the same thing with Jen. He gets this windfall and he just frittered it away, he became a heroin addict, you know, blew it all on drugs, blew it on ketamine. Blue on plastic surgery, and you know it's just like self-indulgent twats. That's what they are. <laughs> well, you know that's uh, it's it's the life of an occultist is often strange. Wiley's an, an interesting point too. He, I mean, I think he was on Hamilton Morris's show snorting, Hamilton, yeah, 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 snorting PCP, snorting PCP. He's got to be in his sixties. Yeah, all, well, you know? Port Timothy was like I think because the process. Uh, cult was so rigorous and anti-drug and they were all celibate and right super intense they, structured yeah, was, super yes, structured right. a very so, difficult grades to go up you had to do once, six months of service all this kind of stuff yeah. yeah once he got out of the process he had a lot of catching up to do so <laughs> gotcha. he, he wanted to get back i mean he was number three he was one of the he was, he was the he was their guinea pig he was the original he really pig. was that's really true yeah what is it uh what Best friend society and all that stuff. Well, he was, um, you know, he went to school with uh, Robert, architecture school. So. Robert, Robert de Grimson, right? Robert yeah. Moore. Yeah. 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 I think Moore is still around somewhere in New York, right? He I mean, is. He's yeah. hiding. I think he works for like AOL or something. Last <laughs> anyone heard of Hiding him. in plain sight, yeah. He was known as the Omega and they had to talk to him through like a like a tapestry or a wall or some crap like that. Man, yeah, know. it's it's kind of like Vanguard, you know? Same right, thing. no, dude, Vanguard, yeah. Oh, It's the same blueprint of stupidity. <laughs> the top, top people that control, the other people trying to learn the secret knowledge, you know, but the, the, the center people always maintain their control, you know? 
it's it's all about conning people to give you their money. That's what it basically boils down to, living off of their work, you know? Yeah, that's interesting. Anything else you want to add, Fred? No, it's uh, it's kind of funny that you're... You're so you're so knowledgeable about all this stuff, and yet take it really seriously. <laughs> well, you've been on the inside; I'm on the outside. You know? Yeah, so yeah, I can't really say I've never. You know, I think that really, if you look at a lot of Crowley, was actually rather hapless. You know, with his followers and who abandoned him, and that there wasn't like this a real community of love with Crowley, even at the Abbey of Philema. So, you know, I'm I'm beginning to have a more nuanced view of these cults. Is really kind of super dysfunctional you know de- you know not very organized really yeah and a lot of people fall a, in and out it's the same with Gurdjieff and, and um, other supposed masters you know they're all kind of full of shit that's a good way to leave it Fred Gianelli do you have any contact information or anything you want to leave for anybody or we can uh, just uh, well it's Fred X at Telepathica F-R-E-D-E-X Telepathica dot com Gotcha. And you're you're on social media. You're on Facebook and uh, Twitter, right? You're on Twitter. Yeah, I'm 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 being a, a nuisance everywhere and barely surviving. Fred Ginelli, formerly of Psychic TV, and uh, really, you've been in the electronic game for at least forty years, man. You should write a book. Uh, I don't have time to. <laughs> All right, Fred. Thank you very I'm just much. Nice chatting you. Thank you. Nice yeah. chatting with you too. I appreciate your time. All right. Take have care. Have a good day. Bye bye.